Today, uh, we're going to talk about snake bite poisoning. Before starting, I would like to introduce myself. I am Dr. Surbhi Chhabra. I am the head consultant of emergency in the Yatharth Hospital, Snoida. And uh, so in the toxicology, uh, this uh, the sessions which we have, which we are conducted, conducting, my topic is snake bite. I think my presentation is, okay. So we are going to study um, uh, under these following pointers. First of all, we'll study about the classification of snakes. Then individually, we'll talk about the signs and symptoms. And then we're going to talk about what are the investigatory things which we have to do. And finally, the management, which will include the pre-hospital settings, the first aid, and then the management in the emergency room. And at last, we'll talk about the anti-snake venom. So this is a very important point that venomous snakes account for an annual estimate of almost 1.5 million to 3 million worldwide. And possibly 1 lakh deaths are recorded. As per the researchers, it has been observed that globally 1 lakh, 1 lakh deaths are recorded if we see, uh, which are mostly from the venomous snakes. So poisonous of the venomous snakes majorly belong to the three families. And it uh, depends on the basis of the poison, poison which they secrete. So amongst them, the first is the viper AD, or they are also known as the crotaline snakes. So this include vipers and the pit vipers. And they, uh, how are they toxic? How, the, because of the venom they are secreting, because they usually block the vascular pathway. So that is why viper AD or the crotaline snakes are also known as the vasculotoxic snakes. The second group or the second family of snakes is the Elipidae. We also know, call them the sea snakes or the hydrophinae snakes. And they act the mechanism of uh, like through which they are venomous. That's neurotoxic because they mostly affect the neuromuscular junction in the body. The third one is the Hydrophidae, which is the myotoxic snakes. And these Hydrophidae, they are mostly found in India. So uh, just a brief uh, workup about the crotaline, coral and the alipid snakes. Generally, we differentiate these snakes on the basis of the clinical findings. So if we talk about the clinical finding, crotaline snakes, this includes the pit viper. And the clinical findings are generally the fang marks. There'll be the local tissue injury where the snake has bitten. It can cause fibrinolysis. It will uh, lead to the clotting uh, factors like PT, INR, DAT derangements. And then it can cause low platelet count, which is thrombocytopenia and the other systemic effects. So if I, we talk about the coral snake clinical findings, they are ma majorly neurotoxic as we discussed. So it's, it causes a neuro neurologic dysfunctions. Alipid snakes, they majorly cause the coagulopathy and then further by the systemic effects. And they cause the deaths because of the cardiac arrhythmias and also the local injury. And they have different antivenoms as per the different family of the snakes. For crotaline snakes, there are two antivenoms, uh, which we're going to discuss in detail. One is the crotalide polyvalent immune fab. And the second is the crotalide immune fab 2, which is equine. The crotalide polyvalent immune fab is generally uh, derived from the sheep immunoglobulins, sheep antibodies. And the crotalide immune fab 2, it is, divide, uh, it is uh, derived from the horse or the equine uh, species. So coral snakes, we have the antivenom, uh, which is specific to the coral snakes. And it is a standard uh, antivenom, which is available. Whereas in the elephant snake, each species has a monovalent or the polyvalent antivenoms with respect to the particular species of the family. So uh, if we talk about uh, the crotalidae, uh, they are generally divided into the viperidae. They are divided into the two groups. One is the vi uh, pitless vipers. The second is the pitted vipers. So pitless vipers are the russell vipers or the saw scaled viper and pit vipers are generally the crotalide family which we call majorly the crotalide family they have the pit vipers or which is a very common pit viper is the green pit viper which is very commonly found. So why are they called pit vipers as we can see very clearly they have a pit here this this the hole right here this is a pit and this actually sends the heat uh, to the predators, like whenever the snake is biting a person or any other animal. So it usually senses the, the temperature of that particular species or the particular animal or the human beings through this fit, through this pit area. So pit vipers, because uh, they have the bilateral depressions or the pits. 
which is located on each side between and below the level of the eye and the nostril so there is the we can just see here is the pit this is the nostril and that's the eye so there is a elliptical slit pupil through which we usually uh, differentiate the pit vipers so pit is again the heat receptor that guides strikes at the warm blooded prey or the predators and then they have two fangs that folds against the roof of the mouth uh so if we uh, generally talk about uh, the clinical the pathophysiology or the clinical manifestation so crotalin venom venom if we uh, see it is a complex enzyme which is uh, generally which causes a local tissue injury and the systemic vascular damage so the systemic vascular damage uh, it can basically lead to the hemolysis fibrinolysis or the neuromuscular dysfunction so what happens is as we have already discussed in the previous slide that uh, it usually is a vasculotoxic uh, species so what they do is they affects the permeability of the blood vessels or the vascular membrane which leads to the immediate loss of blood and plasma into the surrounding tissue and leading to the hypovolemia so because of the fluid loss which happens in the body generally because in all of these systemic manifestations arise and hence leading to the further coagulopathy and the damage and the death so again coagulopathy leading to the cranial nerve damage cranial nerve weakness and uh, generally uh, third and the fifth cranial nerves are damaged and leading to the ptosis and further the patient can also have the altered sensorium i'll have to start again i think yeah okay so clinical features so if we talk about viperidae family or if we talk about pit vipers in specific 25% of these snakes they have dry bites that is the venom they do not really uh, affect the body and the symptoms do not appear like the systemic manifestation they do not appear so clinical evolution is determined by the species in with any respect with any respect to any family of snakes generally the clinical evolution or the clinical manifestation it depends on the species of the snake size of the snake age of the victim time uh, at the point when the snake has bitten a particular human being or anybody so time since which has elapsed since the bite characteristics of the bite that is the location depth number of times snake snake has bitten and the amount of venom that has been injected into the body so all of these leads to the clinical manifestation so uh, if we talk about the main manifestation the cardinal manifestation specifically to the pit viper family so there'll be as i've already discussed there are two fangs which are placed uh, above the area of the snake so there'll be one or more fang marks will be there they can be localized pain they can be progressive edema nausea vomiting weakness can be there and also because uh, there'll be uh, as we have discussed the blood vessels will be majorly uh, affected so uh, oral numbness tongue tingling or the muscle fasciculations can also be there so if we talk about the systemic manifestations here uh, there'll be tachycardia tachypnea your heart rate and the respiratory rate both will be increased it there'll be hypotension because of the pooling of the blood there can be altered sensorium and the loss of consciousness can be there there can be edema swelling near the airway of the muscle compartment which may lead to injury edema which is again life threatening after the systemic manifestation progressive ichymosis can be there and hemorrhagic blebs can be there because of which patient will land up into decreased hemoglobin blood loss pooling of the blood and finally the hypovolemia or the hypovolemic shock systemic manifestation so how will we diagnose so we generally diagnose any type of snake on the basis of the fang marks which are present as we have discussed in the pit viper or the viridae family there'll be the presence of two one or more fang marks will be there and there'll be a history consistent with the exposure to a snake and we can usually define the particular injury or the particular uh, clinical signs and symptoms on the basis of local injury hematological manifestations or the systemic effects so as per the local symptoms there'll be swelling pain ichymosis at the site where the snake has bitten and the hematological manifestation can be there'll be thrombocytopenia low platelet count the coagulation profile would be deranged so there'll be increased prothrombin time there'll be hypofibrinogenemia so fdps will be altered hamara uh, the fibrin fibrinogen degradation products will be altered systemic effect will include the oral swelling paresthesias and the hypotension also the patient may have the metallic taste in the mouth 
there are certain cases of uh, specifically the pit vipers where there will be no symptoms uh, persistent after the snake bite for almost 8 to 12 hours so usually if there are no symptoms after 8 to 12 hours we call it as a dry bite and in such cases we do not give antivenoms so treatment again it depends we treat well many victims are bitten again while we are trying to rescue or capture the snake uh, in case snake has bitten on the first time so if somebody is trying to rescue it the snake might bite again so we have to be very very careful with it just uh, remain very calm after the bite because if the patient is furious or if the patient is mo moving a lot then it increases the venom absorption in the body so immobilization has to be done very very carefully and the extremity the wherever the site of the body where the snake has bitten it has to be kept in a neutral position and you have to be very very careful what do we mean by neutral position it has to be kept below the level of your heart and again we have to ensure the proper and the prompt transportation even if the signs of n venom is venomation is present or not so what are the signs as we have already discussed the systemic manifestations are majorly the sign that we where we can suspect that yes the the venom content in the body has been is been increasing the absorption is increasing so whether the signs or symptoms are present or not we have to transport the patient to the hospital so these days the tourniquets are obsolete the use of tourniquets at the site of snake bite it's obsolete we do not use it anymore instead we use the constriction bands so now let's talk about constriction bands so constriction band is a elastic bandage or this can be a proper cloth any cloth or can be even a thick rope which is applied above the bite so how do we apply it so if we have a cloth uh, if we do not have any particular elastic bandage we just have a cloth what we have to apply how we have to apply it we have to apply it circumferentially around the wound area so enough tension has to be applied that the superficial venous and the lymphatic flow is restricted because we don't want the poison to get absorbed in the body but we want the distal pulses and the capillary filling time to be proper to be restored because just in case we are applying any uh, thick rope or cloth or the elastic bandage too tight then what we are doing we are compromising the blood flow and the pulses will be compromised and because of which will we might have to amputate that particular limb or the extremity of the patient so we have to apply enough tension which is enough to restrict the superficial venous and the lymphatic flow but not tight enough and not uh, not restricted enough to so again uh, one thing has to be very very uh, we have to be very careful uh, with one thing that band has to be snugly applied but loose enough to avoid the, any sort of arterial compromise so how do we check it just insert one or one and a half finger between the compression bandage if you are if you are able to do it if you are able to insert your one and a one and a half to two fingers that means your compression bandage is good enough and you can transport the patient applying by applying that constriction bandage so what is the pre hospital management again as we have discussed immobilization has to be very proper and we have to keep the limb in the neutral position and iv access has to be taken in the another limb oxygen support has to be there transportation has to be asap we are not supposed to delay it even if the symptoms are present or not do not remove the band till the anti venom is available so if this point is really important but then clinical judgment has to be very very careful there have been certain cases in certain researches where we have to remove that constriction band so what are those condition when there is clear cut arterial vascular compromise where we can say we can see that there is loss of distal pulses or we can see that the uh, the limb is turning blue or gray because of the lack of blood flow or the because of the arterial uh, arterio uh, arterial compromise which has happened in such cases we have to uh, remove the constriction bandage otherwise we are not supposed to remove the bandage and also the advanced life support measures as required on sos basis we have to be very very careful with them now comes the emergency treatment or the er management so anti venom is the mainstay but uh, anti venom is usually given in the snake poisoning uh, with a very proper clinical judgment and it it should be given only if the systemic manifestations are setting in so what exactly is anti venom anti venom is a heterologous antibiotic which is antibody sorry which is derived from the serum of animals which are immunized with appropriate snake venoms or uh, and these antibodies what they do they usually bind and they neutralize the venom molecules the venom which has been secreted by the snake 
so these antibodies which are derived from the animals they neutralize those uh, molecules of the snake venom so example if we talk about in the crotalidae poly uh, crotalidae family we use the crotalidae polyvalent immune fab uh, in us usually which is derived from the sheep antibodies and the crotalidae immune fab 2 this is commercially available all over the world and this is derived from the equine or the horse antibodies so now coming to the investigations these are the standard investigations which are to be sent with with each and every snake poisoning suspected case cbc coagulation profile which includes pt inr and ptt fibrinogen levels has to be checked fdp levels has to be checked serum electrolytes glucose levels uh, urea and uh, creatinine levels platelet count ecg and abg so all of these investigations are must they have to be done after the snake bite the sample has to be withdrawn and in case we are giving the anti venom every 4 hours all of these blood investigations are to be checked so now coming to the anti venom so how do we give the anti venom to the patient we have uh, checked all the systemic manifestations and now we have decided that we have to give anti venoms so we have to dilute this anti venom in crystalloids we can dilute in normal saline normally we use normal saline and then this has to be infused in usually slowly in one hour so there is a standard protocol to it patient which which indication of the fab av administration suppose we have chosen the fab immuno uh, fab anti venom injection so what we have to do is we have to establish the initial control of n venomation by administering administrating the 4 to 6 vials so what is exactly the initial control so by initial control we mean that after we have given 4 to 6 vials suppose we are giving these vials and we are giving it very slowly for a period of over a period of 1 hour then we have to see that there are no systemic manifestations uh, they are not prolonging so if we talk about any of the weakness or any of the signs and symptoms if you are talking about any angioedema or if you are talking about any neuromuscular problem so these things are not prolonging after the giving the anti venom injections so if the initial control is achieved then we infuse the additional two vial doses at the 6 12 and the 18 hours interval and if the initial control is not achieved then we have to stop the anti venom therapy right away so again we talk about the systemic features as we have spoken in the initial control so there are two uh, stages pre paralytic stage and the paralytic stage pre paralytic stage usually includes vomiting nausea headache giddiness weakness and fatigue whereas the paralytic stage includes the ptosis because of the cranial nerve uh, cranial nerve derangements ophthalmoplegia drowsiness convulsions loss of consciousness bulbar paralysis respiratory failure and the death so there are certain points which have to be noted very carefully uh, with respect to the anti venom injection so one is the allergic reaction so this can happen to any patient and this is this is routinely commonly seen so we have to look for edema we have to look for uh, any systemic signs if there is hypotension we have to administer fluids if there is any hematological abnormalities blood component replacement has to be required as per uh, whatever is the derangement suppose if we are uh, encountering with low platelet then we have to give a uh, single donor platelet or the uh, we have to give platelet uh, to the patient and if we think the other cell components are deranged then we have to accordingly uh, you know arrange all of those and administer and that is why all of these blood investigation are to be sent every 4 hour interval so compartment syndrome can also happen after the anti venom injections we'll just uh, know about the compartment syndrome so that is why uh, we have to measure the pressure wherever we are administering the anti venom at the site of the bite we have to measure the pressure every 3 uh, to 4 hours so serum sickness is another allergic reaction which includes fever rash and arthralgias or the joint pain which is treated by the doses of iv steroids so compartment syndrome is basically uh, how do we manage it we have to determine the intra compartmental pressure so if we there the pressure is not elevated if we think the pressure is fine which is up to 8 mm of the mercury column then we have to standard uh, continue our standard uh, protocols like administering it every 8 12 and 16 hour intervals but if the signs of compartment syndrome are present and the compartment pressure is above 30 mm of mercury column then we have to elevate the limb or we have to give the manitol so manitol is given 1 to 2 grams per kg iv over 30 minutes and we have to give the finally we have to give the additional anti venom again slowly over 60 minutes and uh, 
so here it is written that if the compartment pressure is elevated and it persists then we have to consider the fasciotomy so fasciotomy role of fasciotomy in compartment syndrome which is associated with antivenom administration it is very controversial so we have to look for the risk benefit uh, and we have to go for our best clinical judgment because a few books actually say that fasciotomy is a treatment of choice in the compartment syndrome and few books correctly say that fasciotomy is not uh, not a treatment of choice with respect to the compartment syndrome which happens as a result of anti uh, venom injections now coming to the elipidae or the second family which includes common uh, cobra which is also known as naja naja and the crate groups so it also includes the coral snakes tiger snakes or mambas so uh, what uh, exactly so this is the uh, picture of a common cobra or the naja naja we call this is very common in india and majorly in sri lanka so they the snake has to be identified it has a hood very well marked hood and uh, and there'll be a spectacle mark as we can just see so this is a characteristic symbol of a cobra so as you can see again this is a cobra so the pathophysiology uh, as we we had seen in the pit vipers so there were the pits which were available but over here there'll be small to medium sized pair of fangs with the grooves so over there pit was detected uh, was detecting the temperature and that's how was the that's how snake is biting the other species and over here there are the grooves so that's how we differentiated and oh, inside the groove it is present the venom channels where the venom of, of the snake is stored so uh, how what is the pathophysiology of uh, uh, cobras here so they are neurotoxic so they usually affect the neuromuscular junctions and they cause the descending symmetric flaccid paralysis so generally this happens after 2 to 12 hours there'll be again uh, neuromuscular damages and damages is happening and the cranial nerves uh, are deranged ptosis diplopia dysarthria loss of facial expressions so everything is uh, as per the descending symmetric uh, paralysis so airway control can airway uh, respiratory paralysis can happen and airway compromise can also happen so also because of the uh, coagulopathy derangements there can be intracranial complications also and because of the neuromuscular compromise which is seen in uh, these particular cobras they can lead to the rhabdomyolysis also so what will exactly happen in rhabdomyolysis kidney derangement will be there it can lead to hyperkalemia it can lead to uh, cardiac arrhythmias and finally the death so clinical features again it depends on the severity and diagnosis happens as per the history clinical features and the lab test which we have already discussed so treatment again pressure bandage has to be given immobilization has to be very very proper again in the neutral position antivenom has to be given only if the systemic manifestations are seen it they are mostly found in australia so if we talk about the uh, antivenom injection so australia uh, there is a five monovalent antivenoms which are majorly uh, available and it has been researched properly in australia whereas the polyvalent antivenom pertaining to cobras it's effective for all the sea sne snakes and it is available globally so if we talk about particularly antivenom pertaining to uh, the cobra so we have to dilute the antivenom in the ratio 1 is to 2 in the crystalloids that is normal saline and the slowly infusion has to be done we have to look at the adverse reaction which has to be monitored very very carefully so most of the times antivenom injections are administered either in the emergency department or in the icu where we can monitor all the vitals of the patient and we can have a close look at the patient and monitor at the adverse reactions coming to the third major family this is known as the hydrophidae snakes so 20 type of sea snakes are found and all of these hydrophidae can be found in india so they all are poisonous and they are myotoxic they affect generally the muscles of the body coming to the difference between the cobra and the viper so we have majorly studied the viperidae and the elapidae so viperidae uh, majorly have the pit vipers and the elapidae family has the cobras so the difference is the body of the cobras are usually long and cylindrical whereas vipers are short and stout so head of the cobras they are small a uh, small head which are covered with lot of scales over there whereas in the vipers they as we have already seen in the picture there is a pit over there and the head is generally larger and bro broader uh, maxillary bones of the cobra they carry teeth other teeth besides the poison fangs are there so cobra along with the fangs they have the teeth also 
so and the vipers they usually uh, they gen- uh, they generally have the fangs there are no teeth which are present eyes in the cobras they have the round pupils they have the round pupils whereas vip- uh, vipers have the vertical pup- pupils and if you talk about the venom so neurotoxic majorly in the cobras and hemotoxic in the vipers so uh, because uh, we, we have already studied as viperidae family they usually lead to hypotension and the blood vascular damage uh, blood vessels are damaged and they are vasculotoxic or we call it hemotoxic whereas cobras they are they usually affect the neuromuscular junctions leading to the paralysis which are that's why we call them neurotoxic so difference between the poisonous and the non poisonous snakes so poisonous snakes they usually uh, the belly scales they cover the entire breadth of the belly that's how we differentiate and the non poisonous snake they are very very small belly snakes and they don't cover the the scales do not really cover the belly so if you talk about the fangs they are hollow like hypodermic needles so if there is a fang mark like a needle mark present on the uh, on the human on the site uh, so mostly we consider it as a poisonous snake so tail of the poisonous snake is compressed and the tail is not compressed in the non poisonous snakes and the if you talk about the habits so poisonous snakes are mostly nocturnal whereas it's not true for the non poisonous snakes if you talk about the teeth bite marks two fangs are present with or without the marks of the teeth whereas uh, in the non poisonous snakes we can always see that there are there'll be a lot of teeth bites also along with the fang marks so that's how we differentiate the poisonous versus non poisonous snakes okay so what exactly are the factors which affects the snake bite toxicity so as i have already discussed the factors generally depends on the body weight so body weight of the patient aggravating factors so supposedly a uh, patient already has a uh, low immunity or patient is uh, generally predisposed to the there's a prior history of the snake bite in there or it also depends on the part which is bitten and individual sensitivity has to be also seen and bite characteristics number of bites how many bite marks are there type of the bites num- bite number depth of the bite duration uh, like for how how long the sta- snake was clinging to the that particular extremity or uh, if the bite has happened through the clothes amount of the venom that has been inserted in the body also the amount of the venom that has been absorbed inside the body condition of the fang marks and of course the species prognosis assessment is generally done uh, at the as per the time of the bite activity of the bite also the first aid which has been taken uh, suppose the transportation to the hospital has been done very smoothly clinical examination and the lab test that's how we differentiate that's how we diagnose and we find out the prognosis pertaining to a particular snake bite so now coming to the management so management part has a local specific in the supportive management so uh, now coming to the specific treatment as per the anti snake venom so what are the indications for anti snake venom so if there is a spontaneous systemic bleeding which we can see or if the uh, if our clotting time is more than 20 minutes thrombocytopenia if the platelet count is less than 1 lakhs or if we have all the systemic manifestations like cyst shock paralysis if we if we have the acute renal failure symptoms if we can see that the kidney functions are deranged the serum electrolytes are deranging or if there are signs and symptoms of rhabdomyolysis supposedly patient is going into renal failure or the potassium level level is raising and there is uh, we can suspect in the ecg that the cardiac arrhythmias are present and also uh, local swelling if the local swelling is more than half of the bitten lip then again we'll consider the anti snake venom or if there is a rapid rapid extension if the swelling is that the swelling is increasing over a period of time then also we'll consider the anti snake venom so anti snake venom ideally administered within 4 hours usually that's the standard uh, treatment and the goal but effective if it's given within 24 hours so if it's a mild case then 5 vials are given 50 ml approximately if the moderate case case then we have to give 5 to 10 vials if severe case we might have to give almost 10 to 20 vials depending on the weight of the patient additional infusion containing 5 to 10 vials are infused until the progression of swelling is ceased or sorry or the systemic symptoms they disappear so again anti serum uh, sorry anti snake venom can be administered slow through the iv injection at the rate of 2 ml per minute 
and avs uh, dilute dilution can be done 5 to 10 ml per kg body weight of in the normal saline or 5% dextrose so normal saline is a good medium to dilute and this has to be infused over one hour and we have to look for all the reactions all the symptoms if the swelling is increasing or if there is any allergic uh, or the serum sickness or any uh, edema which has been developed asv should never be given it uh, should never given locally at the site of snake bite so disadvantages there'll be uh, the pain at the injection site which can be present hematoma formation can be there and there can be increased intra compartmental pressure as we have already discussed so the sensitivity is not really recommended uh, nowadays we don't recommend uh, to check and do a sensitivity test for asv nowadays because uh, again we're going to check then we are uh, prolonging the treatment adverse drug reaction which is seen in 20% of the patient early reaction would be within 10 minutes to 3 hours like urticaria diarrhea tachycardia fever and hypotension late serum sickness that's again the late reaction serum sickness where there will be fever nausea vomiting joint pains arthritis arthritis there can be uh, kidney derangement nephritis myoglobinuria so there are all the late manifestations so if there is any allergic reactions which we are suspecting and there is anaphylaxis also then adrenaline has to be given in the ratio 1 is to 1000 and we have to administer im and uh, h1 antihistaminic uh, can also be given and or also we can use steroids like hiv hydrocortisone can be given in any sort of allergic reaction so treatment it is a five day course uh, if there is a late or the delayed uh, reaction which is seen five day course of oral antihistaminics can be given or patient who even fail to respond within 24 hours and we have to go for the steroids where prednisolone is the treatment of choice supportive therapy in coagulopathy uh, for coagulopathy uh, supportive therapy is if uh, not reverse after asv therapy then we have to consider fresh frozen plasma or cryoprecipitate like fibrinogen or the factor 8 it will all depend after we go for a proper coagul coagulation profile pt inr ptt and fdps have to be checked also platelet concentrate and the fresh whole blood has to be considered if we uh, are seeing uh, delayed systemic manifestations or the neuromuscular uh, manifestation like bulbar paralysis or the respiratory failure then asv alone is not sufficient we have to uh, follow all the other advanced cardiovascular life support like intubation has to be considered tracheostomy has to be considered and we have to resort for the uh, invasive mechanical support again injection of neostigmine 50 to 100 micrograms per kg over 4 hours in the continuous infusion can be given along with the asv glycopyrrolate injection uh, can also be given before neostigmine if we are suspecting there is any bradycardia or the cardiac arrhythmias and uh, care of the bitten part uh, some book says that antibiotic prophylaxis should be given but there are, there have been no specific guidelines or no specific researches where it has been seen that there is any additional role for the antibiotic therapy and again uh, so that's again a controversial statement and also uh, if we talk about the contraindication then uh, pregnancy is not really a contraindication of a, for substitute for giving a patient anti venous serum uh, anti snake uh, venom but uh, again it is again very the research is uh, there are not many researches which have been done and uh, so we have to be very very specific and we have to use our best clinical judgment and the risk benefit ratio ratio has to be considered when it comes to a pregnant patient so this was uh, all about the snake poisoning thank you